Kaifus Kane. The smallest detail. You're gonna never liked people very much, and their returned indifference was fine by him. That was the main reason he joined the Imperial Guard. They told you what to do, and you got on and did it, without any of the social necessities of a civilian life. They found both tedious and baffling. Since becoming a commissar's personal aide, however, you've been forced to interact with others in ways which went far beyond the simple exchange of orders and acknowledgement. Although he remained obscenely wedded to the most straightforward approach in dealing with them. What do you want? The sergeant in the blue and yellow uniform of the local militia asked, looking wearily at him from behind the flakboard counter, wheeling off most of the warehouse-sized room. The god have their own stores. Jürgen nodded, unable to argue with that. Having already worked his way through the inventories of every Imperial Guard Supply Depot close to the Commissar's quarters, he didn't suppose there would be much here worth his attention. But you never know. And it was a point of personal pride to know where he could lay his hands on anything Commissar Kane might feel the lack of a moment's notice. Don't know yet, he said, choosing just to answer the question and ignore the statement of the obvious which had followed it. What have you got? And I'm not here for the guard. He readjusted the shoulder strap of his last gun so he can rummage in the pocket without a weapon slipping to the floor. After a moment, he intricated a grubby sheet of vellum embellished with a seal, and leaned across the counter to bring it within the sergeant's field of vision. The men stepped back hastily, as people so often did when they faced with clear evidence of Jürgen's borrowed authority from close at hand. The bearer of this note, Gunnar Frederick Jürgen, is my personal aide, and is to be accorded all such assistance as he may require in furtherance of his duties. Commissar Kaifus Kane. You with the commissariat? The sergeant asked, a nervous edge entering his voice. And Jürgen nodded. It was a bit more complicated than that. He was technically still on secondment from a Valhallen artillery regiment. He never expected to see again, but... He'd never bothered to find out precisely where he now fitted into the inconceivably complex structure of the Imperial military. No one else seemed to know either, so he found the ambiguity worked in his advantage more often than not. I work for Commissar Kane, he said, keeping it simple, folding his well-worn credentials and returning them into the depths of his pocket as he spoke. So I see. Sergeant Mercer faced an intricating smile toward his face. Though he outranked the evil-smelling interloper, he'd long since learned that his status in the planetary militia didn't mean a thing to most guardsmen. They regarded all locally raised units as little more than a civilian militia barely worth acknowledging, let alone according to any sign of respect. Besides, this particular guardsman appeared to be running an errand for a commissar, one of those mysterious and terrifying figures seldom encountered by lowly militia troopers. And a good thing, too. If even half the stories he heard about them were true, not just any commissar either, but Cain, the hero of Perlidia, who even now was giving the rebel forces infesting the city the fight of their lives, However unwelcome his visitor may have been, it was probably best to appear cooperative, at least until it became clear what he wanted. Jürgen leaned on the counter and raised his gaze to the racks of neatly shelved foodstuffs in the canvas space behind. Can't see a lot from out here, he said. No, of course not. Come on through. Reluctantly, the sergeant lifted a hanging flap in the broad sheet countertop, enabling him to tug open 
a singing gate of the same material beneath it. Jürgen abled through the gap, making a metal note of the man's name at the top of the duty roster tacked to the wall as he passed. Even the most trivial detail can turn out to be important. Well, that's what the commas always said. And you're gonna take in a prospect to heart. Squirreling away whatever nuggets of information he could find as audacity as pieces of unattended food or kit. You never know when something you stumbled across might come in handy. Got an inventory? Yes, the sergeant masseur nodded reluctantly. It's around here somewhere, he said, making a show of rummaging through the shelves under the counter. After a moment or two of Jürgen's patient scrutiny, it became obvious there was no point in attempting to stall any further, and he hurled out a venerable-looking book, leather bound and battered, trying to hide his annoyance. I think you'll find everything in order. Jürgen said nothing as he took it, but his specticism was palpable, hanging around him like a peculiar odor which had accompanied him into the stores. Masseur found himself edging away from the unwelcome visitor, unsure of which he found the more unsettling. I'll get on it then, Jürgen said, dismissing the sergeant from his mind as thoroughly as if the militiaman had evaporated. Monsieur watched as the guardsman worked his way methodically along the store tracks, periodically pausing or leafed through the pages of the venerable tome. Now and again he glanced in Monsieur's direction with an expression of patient inquiry. Some local thing? he asked as a silver of dried meat disappeared through the hole in his beard, accompanied by the squelching sound of mastication. Monsieur nodded. Sand eel from the patch. Only things that can live out in the open down there. The locals raise them for food. Aware that he was beginning to babble, he clamped his mouth firmly shut. The less he said, the less he could find its way back to the commissar's ears. That was, Jürgen conceded, slipping a couple packs of the lechery shards into one of the pouches hanging from his torso armor. There had been none of that in the guard stores. The commissar came generally appreciated the chance of trying new flavors. Under that, they were both seasoned enough campaigners to take the idea of emergency rations, which tasted of anything identifiable at all a pleasant novelty. By the time Jürgen had finished working his way around the shelves, the pouch was considerably fuller than it had been, stuffed with other local vineyards, which the off-world supplied guard stores had been without. There was little enough else to like about Heligen, a world which, in his opinion, was amply named. It seemed worse, of course, and at least the heretics they were fighting were of the human, or human enough, variety, instead of the gleaming metal killers or scuttling tyrannid horrors. But like most of the places he'd been since enlisting, the air was too warm and dry, and the ground too firm underneath. Anything else I can help you with? Sergeant Monsieur asked, and, reminded of his presence, Jürgen shook his head. Got what I came for, he said, passing the book back. I see. Yet the sergeant's voice trembled just a little, or his face seemed trifle, more ashen than I had been. Jürgen didn't notice. But then he seldom noticed things like that anyway. One kind of subtle cue Jürgen was pretty much guaranteed to pick up on, though, was intimidations of danger. By this point in his life, he'd been on the receiving end of enough ambushes, berserker charges, and incoming fire to have taken it pretty much for granted. That if something wasn't trying to kill him now, it was only a matter of time before something did. Accordingly, it didn't take him long to realize he was being followed. He glanced around, tugging gently on the sling of his lasgun, 
to bring it within easy reach of his hand without appearing to ready himself for combat. Sure enough, a faint scuffle echoed in the shadows behind him, as someone took a half-step too many before realizing their quarry had become secondary and froze into immobility in their own turn. Jürgen felt his mouth twitch into an involuntary sneer. Typical malicious sloppiness, he thought. Not a bad place for bushwhacking, though. He had to give them that. He cut down an alley between two of the big storage units, which from the signage stenciled on the ends. He deduced contained small arms and ammunition, neither of which made them worth a visit. Those he could obtain directly from the guard, if he wanted them. Besides, most of the last weapons around here were of local manufacture. But no match for the productions of the Imperial Forge Worlds. He had no desire to find a power pack shorting out on him just when he needed it the most. Which could be any time now. Seeing no point in letting his followers know he was onto them, and needing a plausible reason for his sudden stop, Jürgen unsealed his trousers and relieved himself against the nearest wall in a leisurely fashion. While he did so, he let his gaze travel around his immediate surroundings, as though simply passing the time until nature had run its course. There were two men trailing him, trying to make themselves invisible behind a stack of corroding metal drums. They had almost succeeded, but not well enough to escape the notice of a combat veteran of Jürgen's caliber. A faint clank of metal against metal meant that at least one of them was probably armed. The other direction, a jumble of crates narrowed a gap between buildings. A soldier in blue and yellow was lounging casually against one, puffing on an Itho stick, apparently keeping an eye out for his immediate superior. A performance which would have been a little more convincing if he had spent more time turned in the direction of the alley mouth than towards Jürgen. Completing his task with a sigh of satisfaction, Jürgen rearranged his clothing and his <clears throat> dignity and resumed his unhurried progress towards the smoking trooper. As he expected, the soft padding of stealthy footsteps followed him. Only one pair, though, by the sound of it. That meant the other man would be lining up a weapon of some kind. His opinion of the Hulagen militia plummeted even further. If that were possible. If that were even possible. The gunmen would be as much of a danger to his confederates as to Jürgen. More of one, even. Jürgen had a helmet and flak vests for protection. While the troopers stalking him were dressed simply in fatigues. It never occurred to Jürgen to wonder why these men appeared to be after him. They just were. Reasons were irrelevant. As he passed the smoker, the man attacked, lunging with a combat knife. He hadn't quite managed to conceal behind his body while leaning against the crates. Either he knew what he was doing, aiming a single precise blow at one of the vulnerable points in Jürgen's body armor, or he was an idiot, striking out blindly in the vague hope of finding an opening. Whichever it was, he was out of luck. Jürgen pulled the lasgun off his shoulder, ramming the barrel onto the side of the man's arm, and deflecting his aim with a snap of shattering bone. The blade skittered off the tight, copper fiber weave of his flak vest, and Jürgen pulled the trigger, putting a couple of rounds through the smoker's chest before he even had time to finish inhaling in preparation for an agonized scream. On down. Jürgen turned, seeing the man behind him pick up the pace, hoping to close the distance between them before he could bring the lasgun round to bear. He was a slight fellow, whose uniform hung oddly on him, as though it was a little too large for its wearer which might have struck Jürgen as odd if he hadn't spent most of his life being issued which kit, a kit that didn't quite fit. 
In Pedal Guard uniforms only came in two sizes. Too large or too small. A problem most troopers saw by swapping what they've been given with others in their unit. An option you're gonna never felt inclined to pursue. The running man was carrying a weapon in his hand. A crude stubber, which he brought up and fired as he came. Jürgen didn't flinch. The chances of hitting a man-sized target with a handgun while firing on the run were minimal. He knew, and his flak vest would probably hold even if the fellow got lucky. Which he didn't. A burst of last gun fire from the stationary shooter, on the other hand, was a lot more accurate. Especially if the shooter in question had spent years bringing out moving targets in the middle of a firefight. Stubber man folded and fell, his torso pitted with ugly cauterized wounds, characteristic of last gun fire. His pistol skittering away as he fell flaccid his, as his hand smacked against the ground. He was also probably dead before he hit the ground, but Jürgen put an extra round through his head anyway. He'd seen enough people keep going on battlefield by sheer willpower, long after they should have laid down and died. Insulted by shock and a final adrenaline surge from the full effect of their mortal wounds. As Jürgen ran forward, angling for a clear shot at the man behind the barrels, his boot kicked against the fallen gun, and he glanced down at it disdainfully. It was an old-fashioned slug thrower, crudely made and and clearly not standard issue, even to the militia of a backwater world like this one. No wonder its owner had missed him. It was beyond Jürgen why anybody would choose to use a weapon like that, instead of a las gun he'd been issued with. The man behind the barrels had no such compunction, it seemed. A hail of las bolts chewed up the rock creep footings of the storage blocks, gouging a line of splinters across the crates and the knife man's corpse behind Jürgen as he returned fire on full auto. That would deplete the power pack uncomfortably fast, he knew, but there was no cover he could take, and throwing himself flat to minimize his target profile would simply allow the hidden gunman to pick off an immovable target at his leisure. Better to advance behind a blizzard of suppressive fire, hoping that would be enough to keep his quarry's head down, until he was able to get a clean shot at him, at least. The tactic worked better than Jürgen had dared to hope. The hail of lasboats threw up sparks from the metal drums, punching dents and ripping holes in them, with a clamor which would have struck terror into the heart of an orc. It certainly terrified the hidden gunmen, who stopped firing to retreat behind the metal cylinders. Meager protection, huddling in their lee. Not that it did him much good, liquid being seeped from the punctured drums almost at once. The thick, arid smell of Prometheum lacing the air around them, as Zirkin continued to advance, firing as he came. Either a spark from the impact or heat from a las bolt itself ignited to the escaping vapor. With a muffled thwomp, the whole stack exploded, making Jürgen stagger with this sudden weave of heat. He backed up fast as a lake of burning fuel began sloshing in his direction. Scrambling over the crates, which were already beginning to blacken from the intense heat, just as the blazing tide began to lap against them. From somewhere in the middle of the inferno, he thought he could hear a prolonged agonized scream, which was mercifully cut short in the sudden secondary explosion. Took him in the smoke, eyes streaming from the acid fumes. Jürgen succumbed to the open, gasping for breath. A thick, dense coil of smoke followed him like a questing tentacle, but he ignored it, sweeping his immediate surroundings for any further sign of hostility. Attracted by a noise, a score of more of the lo local militia were running towards him, some carrying fire suppressors, others with weapons ready. 
no doubt under the impression that the rebels were attacking. You, guardsmen, drop your weapon, someone shouted, and Jürgen turned, prepared to fight his way out if he had to. But this time it wasn't an option. Five troopers had their las guns trained on him, and it was clear that these ones knew what they were doing. They were too widely dispersed to take down, even if he tried. He'd only be able to get a couple of them before the others returned the favor. They were dressed differently from the others, too, in body armor and full-face helmets. Unit insignia, which meant nothing to him, stenciled on the chest plates. He knew what they were already. <laughs> anyway... He'd seen plenty of them in his time in the guard. Provost, or whatever they call themselves in the Hilligion militia. Can't do that, he replied evenly. It's against regulations. Imperial Guard troopers were responsible for their lasgun at all times, and although simply putting it down wouldn't be a technical breach of standing orders, the next step would most likely be someone taking it out of his reach altogether. Even ordinary guardsmen would find that threat of being disarmed well nay intolerable. But for a commissar's personal aid, it would be a mortal wound to his dignity. On the other hand, being shot five times at close range wouldn't do a lot for it either. But I'll take out the power pack and stow it. Good enough. The squad leader agreed, and after a moment's hesitation, she raised her visor to look at him directly, and back to the column of smoke still billowing from between the warehouses. Then you and I are going to have a little chat. You've got no idea which unit they were from. The provost sergeant, whose name had turned out to be Lino, asked, not for the first time. Jürgen shook his head. Never saw any patches. He repeated and shrugged. Probably wouldn't have recognized him if I had. Probably not. Lino agreed, but... They should have... They should have had something. She gestured at the bustle of the activity surrounding them. By now, over a hundred militia troopers had arrived to fight the fire, clear up its aftermath, and in many cases, simply take advantage of the free entertainment. Every single one of them had insignia of some kind visible on their uniforms. Those ones didn't, Jürgen insisted, mildly irked at having his word doubted. The commissar would have believed him at once. He glared balefully at the charred cadaver being carried past by a group of troopers, he must have seriously annoyed a superior to be landed with that particular duty, and spat vehemently to relieve his feelings. Not that you could tell from that. Special forces, maybe, Linia speculated, at least willing to entertain the idea that he might not have mistaken. He might not have been mistaken. They'd have better equipment than a backstreet stubber, Jürgen said. And they would have been better shots. Good point. The provostess conceded. To Jürgen's faint and please surprise, she turned to Sergeant Mirsa, who was hovering uneasily nearby, a data slate in his hand. Any luck tracing the las gun one of them was armed with? Mezzo nodded, looking distinctly unhappy. We managed to find several number. I would have thought the metal had melted, but the body... <clears throat> <clears throat> and what was left of it had fallen on top of it and protected it, at least a little bit. He swallowed, turning another shell pater. So who was it issued to? Lena asked. That's just it. It wasn't. Mirza held the data slate out, as though he expected to snap at his fingers. 
It's listed as still in stores. So it was pilfered, Lena said, and Mirza nodded unhappily. Looks that way. And we need to know who by, Lena persisted. If we found out what's missing, we would be able to deduce who's responsible, Mirza said. I'll start going through the inventories. We could start with yours, Lena suggested, fixing the heavy set sergeant with a calculating look. Mirza flushed indignantly. My records are fine, he snapped. What's in the files is on the shelves. He looked at Jürgen for confirmation. He'll tell you. Jürgen nodded. Everything matched. He agreed. He took the thumb in the direction of the latest corpse to be removed, being dragged along in a tarpaulin while sweating, swearing troopers, leaving a faint trail of ash and flakes of charcoal meat in their wake. And I'd have a roll call if I were you. Whoever's missing is probably them. Good idea. Lena concurred. Then we could start chasing down their contacts. Wouldn't be the first time a quartermaster started diverting stuff to the black market. I'll leave it to you then. Jürgen shouldered his las gun and turned away. I'm done here. Maybe you should stay, Mirza said hastily. Jürgen turned back, surprised. What for? he asked. Yes, what for? Lena turned, questioning gaze on the portly sergeant. It's not as though Gunner Sergeant Jürgen's a suspect. Uh, of course not, Mirza said hastily. But he must have assisted the Commissar in his in investigations. Maybe he can spot something we might overlook. Maybe he can, Lena agreed. After a moment's consideration, she turned to Jürgen. Do you think you might? Don't know. Jürgen shrugged. With a try, I suppose. So long as it doesn't take too long. In truth, his involvement with investigations generally went to no further than processing the paperwork and shooting the occasional traitor who resented the his unmasking, but an appeal had been made to his sense of duty, and he felt honor-bound to respond. It was what Kamas Arcane would wish, he had no doubt. Right then, Lena said, looking from one man to the other, and wondering if she just made the decision to consign her career to oblivion. Might as well get started, I suppose. What do you mean no one is missing? Lena asked, handing the data slate she'd just been shown back to the provost, who brought it into her office. A small cubicle on the western side of the militia barracks, which would have seemed crowded with only one occupant. Currently, it had three, Jürgen observing from the corner near the window, which Lena seemed to like jammed open as wide as it would go, for some reason. He had no objection to this, as it gave him a good view of the militia compound, and the city beyond, from which the occasional crackle of small arms fire could be heard. The rebels were making a concentrated attempt to hold on to the southern quarter, with the Imperial Guard equally determined to dislodge them, and show the militia how it ought to be done by breaking a year-long stalemate in a matter of days. Everyone's accounted for, ma'am the prophet said, and withdrew a little hastily, it seemed, to Jürgen. Someone's playing games, Jürgen said, answering twice the cover for them. A common enough dodge in the guard, when troopers had overstayed a, a pass or been too hungover to report for duty. Unless the men who attacked you weren't soldiers at all, Lena said thoughtfully. They were in uniform. Jürgen objected. I went to a party dressed as an orc once, Nina retorted. 
That didn't make me a greenskin. Yoga nodded. The way he'd seen the Kamazar do while considering an unexpected suggestion, and tried to see what she was driving at. You mean they were pretending to be militia troopers? He said at last. Resembly certain he got it. That's right, Lena said, looking at him a little oddly. Using stolen uniforms to get into the base. Which sounded reasonable to Jürgen. If they could steal guns, they could steal uniforms just as easily. If it were me, he added, I'd have set charges in the armory as soon as I'd finished helping myself. First thing we checked, believe me, Lena assured him. Nothing there. Hmm. Mindful that he was a guest in her office, Jürgen spat out the window rather than letting a glob of saliva land where it would. Even the rebels here aren't up to much. If Lena realized that was a thinly veiled criticism of the local forces, she was tactful enough to let it go. Instead, she looked thoughtful. You're right, she said. If rebels could sneak in and steal weapons, they'd definitely have sabotaged what was left, so we couldn't use them. Jürgen's brow furrowed. Who does that leave? He asked. Gangsters, I suppose, Lena said. Plenty of those around, carving up territories from themselves while the fighting keeps us too busy to rein them all in. She looked up as Mirza entered the office. Any luck? I can tell you the records are a mess, Mirza said. Overstocks, items missing, half the inventories read like fiction signs. No change there, then, Jürgen said, shrugging. Yours are the only ones I ever saw that tallied exactly. Moser flushed. I like to pay attention to the details. I noticed, Jürgen said. He glanced at the chronograph and stood. I need to get back. Anything I can help with, contact the commissar's office. Uh, of course. Lena stood too, and began to hold out a hand, then withdrew it hastily. We'll keep you informed. Of course we will. Mizzer added, standing aside to make room at the door. Where's your vehicle? Came on foot. Jürgen lied, and left them to it. In fact, he commandeered a motorcycle, which someone had been careless enough to leave unattended in the regimental motor pool. The better to navigate his way around the roaring of streets surrounding the Imperial Guard deployment zones. He had preferred a salamander, but, but he'd have to divert around so much rubble. He'd been chosen one that they would have all but doubled the distance he would have to travel. After retrieving his mechanical steed, he coasted into the lee of a battle-damaged committer, which a party of engine seers were energetically reconsidering with and waited a few moments. As expected, the distinctive figure of Sergeant Mirza emerged from the building almost at once. At the closest to a trot he could have managed, the heavy-set non com swung himself into the cab of a parked truck against which a soldier with no vehicle unit patch had been lounging in, and gunned the engine, while his companion scrambled up beside him. No sooner were they both aboard than Mirza slammed the lorry into gear, rowing out of the yard as though half the demons of the warp were after him. It was almost too easy. After a quick conversation over his vox speed, Jürgen opened the bike's throttle and set out in pursuit. He hung well back, keeping the illuminator off. Despite the rapidly gathering night, well able to judge the presence of any major obstacles in the carriageway by the intermediate flaring of his quarry's brake lights, 
The risk of being spotted was minimal, he knew. Mercer's attention would be entirely on the road ahead, looking for a solitary pedestrian. Before long, the lorry coasted to a halt at an intersection, where Mirza paused, glancing up and down the covering carriageways. Nothing moved in either direction, except a chimera patrolling the deserted streets. With nightfall came the curfew, and nothing would be moving now except military traffic. Nothing legal, anyways. But there was nothing to worry about. No one would look twice at a militia truck. Where is he? His companion demanded, nursing a last pistol. The armorer still hadn't noticed was missing. You said he was on foot. He couldn't have gone far, Mercer said, still hovering indecisively. If he had picked the wrong direction, the guardsmen would be safely back in the uphill guard compound, reporting to the commissar before they could double back and correct their mistake. Before he could make up his mind which road to take, a motorcycle roared up and out of the darkness beside them, and parked its engine revving next to the cab. As he glanced down and found himself staring along the length of a lasgun barrel with the well-remembered face of the opposite end. I thought you legged. Jürgen remarked. Conversationally, but I wanted to be sure. The commissar always likes to be sure. Before he accuses anyone. They accuses them of what? Mercer blustered, playing for time. Gonna kill me for starters, Jürgen said, as though that had been a perfectly reasonable thing to attempt. You sent those frackers after me, didn't you? By the way of an answer, Mercer floored the accelerator. Jürgen debated pursuit for a fraction of a second, then squeezed the trigger of his lasgun instead. There's no way the cumbersome truck would be able to outrun the motorcycle anyway. So we might as well bring things to an end now. The hail of Lasbolt shredded the lorry's tires, and they watched it veer off course and collide with a half-collapsed storefront with detached interest. As it came to rest amid a small landslide of displaced brick, the passenger door opened, and the Erstat soldier bailed out, firing wildly as he came. He was no better shot than his deceased companions. The Gergen dropped him easily without even bothering to dismount. As he swung his leg over the saddle and began to walk towards the crippled lorry, the chimera ground to a halt a few meters away. Take your time, he said, as the hatch clanged open. What can I say? Traffic, Lena said, which didn't make much sense to Jürgen. So far as he could see, the streets were, well, deserted. She flung the truck's tailgate open, and a cascade of ration packs spilled out onto the cracked pavement. Looks like you were right. Goes I was, Lugan said. Inventories never match up with what's actually in stores. The only reason Mercer's would is if he was covering something. Lena nodded. Where things are now, food's like currency on the streets. Him and his gangster friends must have been making a fortune. She paused to glare at the sergeant, who was being praised, none too gently, out of the battered cab by a couple of her provosts. He must have realized you spotted something was wrong, and sent his, uh, his accomplices to keep you quiet. That's how I see it. Jürgen agreed. I don't still... I still don't get why he wanted to keep me around, though. So we could try again, you idiot! Mercer called, as he was half dragged and half carried towards the chimera. If you told the commissar, we'd be finished! Told the commissar, Jürgen repeated in tones of honest astonishment. I bother him with a bit of pilfering. Everyone's at it. Mercer's response was vocal, 
prolonged and unflatteringly inaccurate about Jürgen's genealogy. Jürgen listened and passively for a moment before quieting down with a well-aimed punch to the face. Ladies present. He admonished, although he suspected Lena had already heard a good deal of profanity in her line of work. Besides, he resented people trying to kill him. We might need a statement, Lena said after a moment, during which the power of speech seemed to have deserted her for some reason. Jürgen shrugged, his attention already on the crippled truck. You know where to find me, he said. After all, he still had a bit of free space left in his utility pouches. Alright, that's going to do it for another short story of Kaifus Kane and Jürgen's Adventures. Sorry for not having that many video, uh, videos out. A lot of stuff has been coming up, including me getting sick, if you couldn't tell from the audio from this one. I try to keep it out as much as possible, but I've been coughing up a lung constantly, and my sinuses are completely filled. That is why I wasn't able to do that many voices for this one. That's why I'm holding back on doing Kyphus Kane, because I can't do his voice properly. For the audiobook, so I'm kind of just like... Ah, shit, I can't do anything right now. My voice is kind of ruined a little bit. There's... Oh, no. So, yeah, it's a little messy. <laughs> uh, hopefully in a matter of um, three or four days, I should be over it. No time soon. This is actually the least amount of sickness I've had. And for the last video for the subscriber special... It's more of a thank you video than anything else. I, I think I should change the name of it to that, or just add abbreviation to it. If you already see an abbreviation added to it, that's because it is literally just a thank you video saying thank you to anyone that, well, is subscribed to the channel and leaves a comment or likes any of the videos. You know who you are. You're all amazing people, and I gotta say thank you again. And let us not forget about the outstanding... Patreon supporters, Mr. Crossman123, Coke Koa, Zach Keller Coffee, Meltdown480, Eldrick Maldred, Fortress Unam, and Doskoski was right. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon supporters of the channel. If you want to be a Patreon supporter of the channel, does it get like random drawings that I do, or just chat with me, or just take place in polls? before they actually reach YouTube itself, then you can! You can leave anytime you want. You can stop anytime you want. 100% up to you. Anyways, that's gonna do it for this video. Thank you for watching another one. You're amazing people. Hope you have a good day. And I can't wait to see you in the next one. Alright. Stay safe out there, and have yourself a good one. Goodbye.